hear the pop and cheers and play the characters that you cheer. So join us as we go, 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 below the frame. On this episode of Below the Frame, we're talking with Muppet performer Bill Beretta. You know him. He plays Pepe the King Prawn, Swedish Chef, Rolf, Bobo, and Dr. Teeth, and so many more. He is also very funny, and I laugh a lot at him. We're also going to talk a little bit about lip sync, so give one flap per syllable. It's time to go Below the Frame. Go, 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 Below the Frame. Welcome to Below the Frame. It is here where fans of Sesame Street and the Muppets learn about the people under those characters that you love and a little bit about the art of what we do. I'm your moderator to the Muppet performers, Matt Vogel, and we've got another good one for you today because we are talking with my buddy Bill. Beretta, that is. He is uh, such a funny person. He always makes me laugh a little too much. Uh, he is an incredible performer, and, and I think you're going to love this chat. Uh, as I mentioned in the tease there, Bill plays Pepe and Bobo, Rolf, Dr. T, Swedish Chef for the Disney Muppets. He was also inside Earl Sinclair for Dinosaurs. I love that show. And he played uh, <laughs> Clueless Morgan in Muppet Treasure Island. Uh, Bill's done a lot of great work, and uh, You know, it's an example of a guy that has really worked hard to get where he is, as you're going to soon see. Uh, Oh, I want to give you a fair warning here. There are uh, there's some language in this episode, but I've I've bleeped it out for your convenience, uh, just in case. So, uh, you know, you can make a game of it. Try to figure out what words we said, or just make up new nonsense words to go where the beeps are, if you like. Okay, so are you guys ready? I know I am. So let's go below the frame with Bill Beretta. Below the frame. Bill Beretta. Yes. Welcome to Below the Frame. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much for talking with me. I'm thrilled to be speaking with you, my friend. Well, you know, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, I was actually I was looking for I was looking at the 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 material. I had a crack research team. Really? How many people? Just one. Oh. Uh, and his name is Andrew. And he okay. sent me, you know, I, I was looking at it thinking, how am I going to do this? There's so much to talk about. I don't oh. I don't even know where to begin or how to shape this. So it's, it's going to be kind of a combination of deep dives and uh, shallow wades into some water. Does Sounds that, beautiful. Doesn't it? Sounds it doesn't really it sound, beautiful. Oh, just Really. <laughs> so we'll just start. We're just going to do it. Can we it. curse? If I curse by mistake, do I get in trouble? No. So, no. so curse Let's away. Yeah, you can say that. It's fine. Great. Yep. Yep. All right. But don't it. say ass. I won't. Because I'll probably have to bleep it. Right. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. We'll see what happens. Yeah. So, Bill, f- it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you grew up in Pennsylvania. That's a myth. Is it? Where did you grow up? <laughs> I did grow up in Pennsylvania. What actually, part? I, I was born in New Jersey, actually. Oh, you were? I was born in Trenton, New oh, Jersey, and the first, first four years of my... Well, then what are you asking me for? I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, no, but... Um, so I was born in Trenton, New Jersey, and then we eventually moved, after I was four, mm-hmm. to a town called Yardley, Pennsylvania, which is right there along the Delaware River. Um, and so I grew up near Washington's Crossing and wow. New Hope. Yeah, it's yep. so weird that a lot of puppeteers somehow have come from Pennsylvania. You, uh, huh. Fran Brill, uh, oh, Ryan right. Dillon. Yes. I, I mean, Tacani. He comes from Tacani. Uh, yeah. So weird. Got, they got a particular uh, accent over there. Oh, do they, did you? You didn't get an accent, did you? When you didn't have an accent when I, you were growing I up. I think when I was younger, I had a little bit of it because my half of my family was still closer to Philadelphia and Jersey, mm-hmm. up up near that way, and. But kind of further down, well, I don't know. I don't know why I don't have it as much. I think I had it probably when I was younger, but... Tell me about your family, your parents. Uh, What'd they do? What'd they do? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) What did they do? Okay, so, uh, well, I'll tell you. What they did was they gave up probably their dreams to have a family. What 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 they give up? Well, at, at that time, you know, people were supposed to get married and have kids and, yeah. you know, build a family. And and my mother was a beautiful woman. She was a model. And um, I think she wanted to be an actress, you know, and I think she could have been if she pursued it. She had just 
great sense of style about her, and <laughs> she was funny, clever, smart, you know, beautiful. So I think she could have been, a, seriously, like a movie star if she really wanted to. I think she would have been a great actress. Um, but she loved being a mother, you know, so I think she, she went, she followed what I think people expected her to do and tried to, to model as long as she could. Cause so she still did that, you know, as yeah. we were growing up to a certain degree. Um, and then she became, uh, a registered nurse. She worked in hospital wow. and worked in the OR. Yeah. She worked in the OR. Jeez. She would bring, she, <laughs> she'd bring home like what they put somebody's leg together with, you know, we're like, <laughs> <laughs> why are you doing that? Yeah, why screw the screws? What do you mean? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, so, and she raised us. You know, my parents divorced when I was 11, so my mother was really the one who raised Gene and I. But my dad was a great athlete. He was um, drafted to the Philadelphia, what, were they the, not the A, were they the A's back then? Before the what, what Phillies was it? Uh, ba- oh, so baseball. He was a pitcher. Yeah. Oh wow. And uh, and so he was great at sports and he was great at basketball and but he was going to be a pitcher and um, he got sick. I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember what it was, but he wasn't allowed to play. Mm. And then he lost the opportunity and ended up. Um, doing whatever he could, I guess, to make ends meet. And, and I guess he had an interest in cars. I never really asked him. But he became a car salesman and then became, a, you know, just kind of made his way up through the ranks of selling cars. Yeah. You know? um, and he was a, another great sense of humor. I think that's why my parents got along. They both had a good sense of humor. My yeah. father was very funny. And he was a good singer. You know, my father was a great singer. And... Uh, so he would, he's actually the influence for Johnny Fiamma. Oh, really? Because, oh, yeah, because uh, every son, so after my parents divorced, my father would come and get us on Sundays, you know. And every Sunday, there was a radio station that he played. It was called Sunday with Sinatra. And that's all we ever listened to. So I grew up listening to all that kind of music and him singing. And yeah. So I think they both could have been something in the arts or sports. You know, my father in the sports and singer, but but I think again they they decided to raise a family and uh, and then get divorced. So it worked out yeah. great. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but it was just you and your brother Gene, and yeah. uh, and is Gene older than you. Oh yes, absolutely. Way older. <laughs> Way. Wait, he's is he? four years older. Yeah, he's four years older. And what yes. did you guys do as kids? I mean, were you guys, cl- were you close? Very, yeah. Uh, Always close? Yeah. He, uh, I mean, really, whatever we did as kids was because of whatever Gene thought of, you know? He would yeah. say, we're going to we're gonna make a movie. And he uh-huh. got my grandfather's camera, like just a regular old 8mm, and came up with a story, and I put me in it, you know? And so I basically did whatever he thought of. Yeah. You know, jump off the roof. Here, this is the scene where you jump off the roof. <laughs> And you die in and the you bushes. And I, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or or animation. He would do clay animation. You know, he's just um, a very creative kid and, and no fear. And just thought, well, here's something I want to do, you know. Uh, and then just, you know, the puppet side of it was he just thought, I think I'll just write to Jim Henson and ask him how you make puppets. You know, and he did. Really? And, uh, yeah, he sent him a letter. And actually, at, at the time, because Gene drew all the time. It's all he ever did was draw, draw characters, cartoons, flip books, you know. Um, and now he does and, that. Well, He's a he, very yeah, successful he, illustrator. Author, illustrator for children's books and yeah. did animations for Sesame Street. But way back then, he was drawing and he wrote a letter to Jim Henson. He did. And he had, but, but he had a letterhead that he created. Right, he's, he's fourteen. He had a letterhead, and in the corner of the of the letter at the top is all these characters that he created. But Bert and Ernie are in there, you know, uh-huh. and all his favorite kind of characters. And so he sent this letter to Jim, and and Jim sent it back. This is nineteen seventy four, I think hmm. seventy three or seventy four. And Jim sent this lovely note back, very encouraging, you know, saying, um, you know, I look forward to seeing what you create. You know, I love what you did with your, you know, based on your letterhead, very creative. And he sent this instruction thing about how to make a Muppet. 
Really? Uh, yeah, which they, is, I guess, something they had back then. I don't. I think Dave Goals told me that he maybe remembered it, or Frank told me hmm. that he remembered it, but it was wasn't like a normal kind of thing that they did all the time. But the fact that he went out of his way and sent this letter back to this kid, you know, and and then so Gene found a foam and fabric store somehow in our town, and that's <laughs> we went and got googly eyes and you know fur and made. Were puppets. you what year did you say this was? Seventy four, like seventy four. So, so the Muppet Show was wasn't 10. around yet, but but uh, oh no no, but Sesame, Sesame Street was. Was that what you were you were kind of wanting yeah, to was, do puppets yeah. because of Sesame Street? Yeah, Gene was inspired by Sesame Street, you know, and and I was too, but not. I never thought I'm. Let's make puppets. I just right. waited for him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I just tell followed you what whatever do. he thought. Yeah, it's basically, I don't think I would have been doing what I do, whether it's acting or this puppet world that we live in. If it wasn't for him, you know. Hmm. Don't tell him. I haven't. It'll go to his head. I know. He's a <laughs> oh, I said it. Now you're going to have to bleep. <laughs> uh, oh, well, sorry. Oh, shit. I know. It's all right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Gene, you, you and Gene made puppets. Well, actually, my cousin Gary, who was a year older than Gene, they were very close as well. So the three of us tended to do things together. And Gene and Gary actually made uh, the kind of first two characters. Mm -hmm. And they look kind of like Bert and Ernie, but they were Western. They were like cowboys. And then we would do shows for the family because that's what we did on yeah. weekends usually. The family would get together, 30 people or whatever, somebody's house we'd all go to. And then the, the, the cousins, there were nine of us, uh, would put on a show. It was like a little variety show or something, you know. And part mm -hmm. of it was a puppet show. Another thing was dance. Another was acrobatics. And I don't know how long we did this. Maybe it was a year at the most. Not not all the time. Uh, but my aunt, my Aunt Kathy, uh, is a deaf-mute teacher. And so we went to her school. And I remember doing a show for the kids there. And it was all set to music. And I remember they took the a big, remember the big speakers when we were kids, the yeah. big, huge speakers? Yeah, yeah. They would put those fa on the floor, facing the floor, so the kids could feel the vibrations. Wow. So anything we did was to music and confetti, and it was all visual. Yeah. You know? um, that was great. I loved doing that. That was amazing. And and how old were you at this time? You were 10, 11? Yeah, probably 10. Did you ever like think, that. wow, this is the thing I want to do? No. I want to be a puppeteer. No. Did you know what you wanted to be? Or? I don't know if I knew. I, I, I knew that I loved to uh, entertain. You know, mm -hmm. I got a lot of feedback from <clears throat> family shows, yeah. you know, and, and school. I was in plays at school. So I think I knew I wanted to entertain people, but I, not as a puppeteer. I didn't think that was really something you did. Were you thinking, oh, I'll just be, I'll be an actor? I think so. I think that's... Before I realized that's what that is, yes, an actor is what I wanted to become. So once I was of the age where I realized what that meant, then yes, that was my goal, is to be seen as me playing something. And did you do that? Did you go up, you were in plays all through high school, did you decide you were gonna go to college to do that? Actually, more than, than school was a youth group. And that's really where I think I I got like my guts to, to think this is what I want to do, because that was an audience, yeah, not just my school. That wasn't right? your family either. Right. It was a community that came to see these things. And so I love doing that. And so I think that's where I really thought, okay, this is what I really want to do, you know? And so I, I, I quit school when I was 16. You, so you, you left high school? Yeah. My grades were awful. And uh, I, I didn't want to stay back a year if that was what was going to happen. And I just thought, you know, I'll, I'll get a job or something and, and just try and go study acting somewhere and, and try and do that. Because school's not, I can't see myself in college. I don't know what I'm going to do there. Right. You know, I wasn't a great student. I just used to go to school to entertain people. So what, did, you know? what, what, what was your plan? <laughs> what was your plan? I'm going to quit school and I'm going to do get a job. But so, well, so I, yeah, I don't know if I had a plan. I think <laughs> I knew what I didn't want to do, right. I guess. Yeah. And, and so because, again, just going back to my parents being divorced, my mother raising my brother and I, as I got to be 16, my mother was working and she wasn't home as much. And so... It was more, you know, we had to just be responsible for what we did. Gene went to college. 
I was still in high school, but not doing great. Mm-hmm. And then I think it kind of came to a head because I met um, I met a girl, ah. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up leaving home and going and living with her at seventeen. Oh, so I was on my own basically. Big yeah. uproar with the family. I'll bet. Yeah. Uh, but they um, ultimately, people, I guess, understood. Actually, my Uncle Harry, as I was walking to this place that I was moving to, and my mother was, I was so upset, you know, and what I put her through. I mean, geez. But um, I'm walking, got my bag, and I'm walking. And my Uncle Harry, who's my mother's youngest brother, pulls up next to me, and he goes, get in. I was like, I'm, no, I'm going to the room. <laughs> He's like, I'll take you. I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, get in. I'm going to take you. Why are you going to walk? I'll, I'll take you there. Huh. So I got in, and we talked. And he listened to me, and he figured, I guess, maybe somehow I knew I needed to do this, and I'd have to go through it to figure out whatever that was. Yeah. And he took me there and dropped me off and told me he loved me, and I'd never moved back home. You know, I just continued on. Uh, really? Being on my own, and and, and so so, uh, seventeen years old, I go. Um, I'm living not far from Langhorn, Pennsylvania, which is where Sesame Place is. And I go and I get a summer job as a parks employee. I'm in the guest relations department. I'm helping kids get on these rides, and I'm uh, you know cleaning out toilets and bathrooms and whatever you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, I have a little uniform that I get to wear, <laughs> and so. <laughs> I was there the first summer. Second summer, they have these new installations. It's uh, Oscar in a trash can, an automated Oscar. And they put it in the food factory for whatever reason. They, that's where the people would go to eat. And they put it in there to test and see how it would do. And I had to watch it. They would have, you know, people would have be shifts and you would stand there and watch it. And you'd make sure people didn't mess with it. And it, and it just so happened that the food factory had these big windows, and I could see the front of the park, uh, the entrance. And I'm sitting there just, you know, watching people look at him. And Oscar's doing his stuff. And I see Jim Henson coming through the, the gate. A guy looks like Jim. And I'm thinking, that's Jim? That's Jim? That's, got it. that's Jim? <laughs> and I left my post, <laughs> and I went running out there, and I went up to him, and I put my hand out, and I said... Mr. Henson, welcome to Se- <laughs> welcome to Sesame Place. <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, well, thanks. Uh, hey, do you know where the uh, uh, where the uh, Oscar is? Do I? <laughs> right this way, you know." And uh, I took him to the Oscar where I was supposed to be, and I basically just watched him watch the people watch Oscar, and he wanted to see how that operated, you know. And I just always remember thinking wow. how cool that it was. He didn't come in some special way, you know. Mm-hmm. He didn't come in the guest relations VIP thing. He just came through the front gate, yeah. you know. And I thought, that's really cool. That's just a guy, you know. And that was it. I never talked to him again or anything then, you know. It wasn't like, I think maybe he said thanks. and Like, okay. <laughs> and then later that, so- well, and then I guess not too long after that, I saw this blonde-headed kid. Working one of the rides in a uniform, just like me, and uh, he had a little tag on. It said Brian. <laughs> I was like, "Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Good. How you doing?" And I found out later that day that it was Brian, you know, Henson, and we kind of just hit it off. And uh, oh, I know, I want to tell you something specifically about Sesame Place. Yeah, I was sitting in the cafe, our, our cafeteria, our, our little break room, and uh, yeah, I was having my lunch. And I look down the table, and there's this guy with this little Dutch boy haircut with headphones in. And he's eating a sandwich and going like this, like that, yeah, going like that. <laughs> uh-huh. And I had no idea, but Big Bird was going to show up and be there that day. And it was Carol just sitting there rehearsing, uh-huh. you know, with his little headphones wow. in. And I had no yeah. idea, but I remember the moment. I remember that guy, you know. With his yeah. beard. You didn't say anything. No, I didn't know him. I didn't know what, who he was. I mean, you know. Yeah. But yeah, then I was like, oh, Big That's Bird's cool. here. And it took me a while. I don't think I realized it for another day or two. I thought, oh, was that that guy? Yeah. That was the guy eating a sandwich and <laughs> yeah. moving his hand. That was really cool. Wow. So that was really like my first kind of exposure to like 
somebody with the Muppets, you know, like that was in yeah. gym, that, those two kind of things. And you liked the Muppets and you liked <laughs> Sesame oh Street, God. but again, you were Muppets. just... I never thought I would be a no. puppeteer or anything. And, and I watched the no. Muppet Show. I wasn't like a, because I was, I wasn't like a diehard fan, but I loved it, you know, when I would see it. Yeah. So I didn't, what year was Fraggle Rock? Because like, I missed Fraggle Rock. I think I got older. I was older and living on my own. It's like 80, I want to say 82, but somebody's going to. So, so that's like you know. when I, you know, had left and was on my own. And I think I didn't, I wasn't thinking about those kind of things. I was trying to just survive, you know. So I missed yeah. some of that stuff. But the Muppet Show, Sesame Street was huge for me as a kid. You know, it was a big, big thing right. for me. But yeah, I never thought I would be a puppeteer. And so anyway, Brian and I became friends over the summer. Uh, he and I were the only two that we knew of that were actually living off of our paychecks because he was renting a little place in Princeton and he would drive oh. back and forth and I was living yeah. on my own. And so we would each have like $90 a week or I think it was, something like that. And, <laughs> and we used to like watch kids because they had lockers. The other like guys with kids working yeah. there, they just throw their paycheck in their locker, you know. Like, <laughs> oh, they're going, they're going home yeah. at the end of the day, you know. Uh, and we were like, oh my god, you know, we got paid. And so we, uh, we, yeah, we hung out. He had a girlfriend. I had my girlfriend. We ended up going to like Atlantic City one time, and we just became, you know, friends for the summer. Yeah, and uh, and then just. Kind of kept in touch over the years until later yeah. when we did Dinosaurs. And then what was your next step beyond that? So then I moved to the big city, right? To Philadelphia. To Philadelphia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And worked at a uh, a uh, display, Nathan's, Nathan's display <laughs> company. And they provided displays for, you know, big uh, department stores and mm -hmm. little stores, lighting stores and all kinds of racks and statues and things and I would yeah. put them together I would go to these places and I would put everybody's racks together in the department stores or I would sell them and you know so that was my job so then I started working as a waiter at a very kind of well-known spot which I was fortunate to get I ended up working at a place called Bookbinders which is an old seafood restaurant in in Philadelphia not what I thought it was going to be no uh, <laughs> just by the they, name of it <laughs> <laughs> but a big, you know, tourist kind of place. People would, had been going for years and years. Uh -huh. It was a whole place. And I worked there as a waiter and made good money there. And um, and then I started taking acting classes yeah. with a private acting teacher, a man named Sidney Kay, who was a phenomenal mm -hmm. teacher. And I started to learn really about the craft more and the tools. And he recommended that I go to the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York because he thought I should be in that community, and he wanted me to meet Sanford Meisner, and because he went there, he was he was a student teacher. He was a student teacher for Sanford Meisner, and he just felt like I should go do that, and I did. So you moved to New York. What did you do in New York? What did, what did you do for money? Well, so I I I worked as a waiter in two places, two oh. two kind of waiter jobs, and then I went to school during the week. Were you making yeah. good money? It was enough, I guess, to you know. For what I needed, it wasn't like I was, hey, LA, New York, <laughs> hey, let's go to Broadway. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to see a show tonight. Yeah, you, you weren't know? dining out all the time. And, Not at all. No. And uh, and certainly traveling underground, you know, yeah. no taxis, walking or traveling underground, basically. Tell me a little bit about your acting class. This, well, is, the this is the Meisner technique, yeah. correct? Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> it was. And yeah. you have to audition for it. You know, you have to audition to get in. And not for him, because there are other teachers. He was, I believe, 88 at the time. Wow. So he wasn't there all the time, but he came, I think it was at least once a week. Maybe a little less than that. I, I, I don't remember exactly. I felt like he was there all the time, because mm -hmm. it was just, the place just felt like him. You know, yeah. you walked in the door and immediately the wall has Gregory Peck and Robert Duvall and, you know, everybody you've ever loved Jeez. and their their style of acting has been there. And, the, the, you know, the history is just amazing. But but so he's 88 and he's got just about every uh, ailment you could think of, right? <laughs> he's yeah. got cataracts in both eyes, so he can't see great. Okay. 
He has elephantitis in his left hand, so it's all swollen. He was hit by a truck, so he's got a cane. Oh, God. He had cancer in his throat, so he has to talk by burping, uh, right? Swallowing, there's a hole in his throat. Yeah. And, and so when he talks, he has to go, <laughs> you know, and, and swallow and go, this is the way we're gonna do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a play, play. You know, that was like. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. And this is, the, the, he would sit on the edge of his desk and he had a desk. There was maybe a couple chairs and a little desk set up over there for people to do their exercises and do their scenes or whatever. And um, he would sit on his desk or sit in a chair looking at us, not doing the scene, but at the people watching. Uh -huh. And he listened. The, 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 the thing that was left were his ears. Yeah. And he could, and that's what the, the technique's all about, listening, right? Mm -hmm. Moment to moment listening. Yeah. And that's what he would critique you by just listening. He didn't even watch us do our stuff. He would go, <laughs> that's false, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you don't mean it. You know? <laughs> uh, but it was really great to watch. Aside from him, there were other great teachers. Yeah. Um, a guy named Richard Pinter, who was amazing. He was just this big, big personality and just amazing teacher, just inspiring and could pick things out like in a second. Bullshit, you know? Wow. Bullshit. Bullshit. You know, what are you doing? You're bullshit. Bullshit. And then there were other, another teacher, Ron Stetson, another great teacher, really like passionate and, and, and wanted you to really kind of get it and feel yeah. it, you know? He, he really just got it. And between all the teachers, it was just a great experience. I, I actually had one of my first big auditions because of being at the Playhouse. I did a play our final year. Joanne Woodward came, she was a student there. Mm. And uh, Eli Wallach was a student there. Wow. Anyway, uh, so she came, and she, after she saw the show, she said, would you come and audition? We do this thing up in Woodstock, I think. They do some sort of outdoor theater, upstate New York thing that she had done mm -hmm. for years. And she said, I'd love you to come and just audition for this thing. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then, so, so this is my, you want to hear my audition? Yeah. Okay. This is how my audition goes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's at her, there, her and Paul uh -huh. Newman, their apartment. Not, it's not at a studio or a stage or anything. It's at their apartment. So I go there. I go upstairs, I go up in the elevator, I come to the door, it's just like, hi, hi, come on in. There's like little cakes, you know. Paul Newman's picture just happens to be there on the, ta on the table. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Butch casting the Sundance thing over here. Oh, and, uh, and I go in and there's just a camera set up in their living room and somebody's behind it, some assistants, another, hi, I'm somebody, you know, and, hi. And, uh, okay, we'd love you just whenever you feel comfortable, why don't you just say your name? And, you know, you just begin. And I was like, okay. And I go and I sit in front of the camera there and I set up and, uh, okay, here we go. And action. Hi, I'm Bill Beretta. All right, should we start the scene? Okay. And the next thing, for the next, like, three minutes, because it's about a three-minute scene, two minutes, I hear, that's all I hear coming out of my mouth. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh. I have no idea what I'm saying. You're just... I can't hear them. Uh. I'm just like, it's a tunnel. And I'm, I, I stop, <laughs> and I don't even know. I don't even think I knew it was over. I was just like, uh. well, thanks, Bill. Thanks for remembering. <laughs> Uh, Thanks for coming. I was like, okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> Never uh, heard from them. You didn't hear from them. I was surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like, what happened to you? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, you just I got, just or blanked. you were too inside your own head. Literally, I, because that's all you could I, hear was the echoing sound of your own voice. I think it got too real being like in their home or something. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, man. It just, I went just deaf. Oh. 
and no, had no idea where it was like like getting uh, punched in a fight or something, yeah. you know, where you just just don't know. I don't know what that's like. Oh, I've never been punched in the head. Have you been punched oh, in the head before? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've had a couple good ones actually. Yeah, really? In the, in the streets of Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh God. Damn. Yeah. Okay. On a well, on a basketball court. Oh man. But I the, won. You won. Okay. But you still yeah. they got their licks in though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hang on there, Bill, because it's time for a word from our sponsor. One night at a fancy pants party where a lot of conversation is happening. <laughs> yes, yes, I know it was hilarious. Mm, say, Edith, mm, you've been pretty quiet up to now. Why don't you take the focus and say something? Oh, well, I don't know what to say. Edith, what's wrong with your mouth? Yes, you're talking, but your mouth is kind of moving at random times. Your lips are not at all in sync with your words. <laughs> Edith and so many other puppets like her suffer each and every day. Oh, what, what am I gonna do? My mouth is only opening every other way to so if I'm lucky. And sometimes it, it, it just hangs open. What you've got is a terrible case of bad lip sync. Oh, no! Calm down, Edith. Besides, you're yelling, but your mouth is closed. Well, what am I going to do? Don't fret, Edith. There's help. There is? What is it? It's good lip sync. Good lip sync? What's that? Good lip sync is what every puppet needs to help them look realistic and more lifelike. Without good lip sync, you're just a poorly dubbed monster movie waiting to be made fun of at a fancy pants party where a lot of conversation is happening. Well, how do I get good lip sync? Well, Edith, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of commitment, and for starters, you need to know the alphabet. Hey, I know the alphabet! Good for you, Edith, and you've got a fighting chance. Just practice saying the alphabet, and every time you say a letter, open your puppet mouth one time, except for the letter W. Oh. What do I do on W? It might be a little advanced for you, Edith, but let's just say you open your mouth more than once for W. Oh, all right. Practice good lip sync every day if you want to look realistic and more lifelike. And who knows, Edith, the next time you're at a fancy pants party where a lot of conversation is happening. Mm, Edith, you've been pretty quiet. Have you anything to say? Oh, do I? I've been waiting a long time to give you all a piece of my mind. So I... Eat it. Your mouth. It's working. Your lip sync is incredible. Thanks, good lip sync. Good lip sync. It's kind of important. That's right. Today's episode of Below the Frame is brought to you by Good Lip Sync. Oh. That's probably my oldest son, Jack. Come in, Jack. Hey, Dad. How's the podcast going? Come on in. Come on in. Great, Jack. It's uh, Thank you for asking. Still doing those fake ads instead of real ads? Yes, but I told you the purpose of the fake ads is to initiate a conversation about puppetry. Oh, I, I know that. I'm literally just saying what you've written for me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So the fake ad for today, what's it about? Uh, good lip sync. That actually sounds like it's kind of important. It is, Jack. But also kind of obvious. Oh, yeah. It, okay. Look, uh, maybe it's obvious to you out there that you need to have good lip sync when you're a Muppet performer. Uh, it, obviously, it's essential. But, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about how to get good lip sync, here's Muppet performer Peter Lintz. Peter? To practice your lip sync, first raise your hand like you're asking a question, but keep your shoulder relaxed and your elbow slightly bent. Now bend your wrist, making your fingers point straight ahead. Next, tuck your thumb underneath your fingers and touch the tip of your thumb to the underside of your middle finger. Now keeping your four fingers together, bend them in a nice gentle arc to get the tip of your thumb in a more comfortable place. Got it? Congratulations, you've just made a puppet skeleton. Now, keeping your hand as relaxed as possible while still maintaining the shape of that nice gentle arc, open and close your thumb creating a space between the tip of your thumb and the underside of that middle finger. As you do this, imagine the words you want to say coming directly out from your palm and going through that opening. Be sure to close the mouth between every syllable, otherwise your puppet will look like they're talking like this. Also, don't pick each word out of the air as you speak it. 
That's called negative lip sync, and it's the opposite of what you want to do. Your final challenge is isolating your thumb when you lip sync. Now, when people speak, our heads don't flip back with every syllable. It's just our lower jaw that does the opening and closing. Likewise, to make your puppet more realistic, practice opening and closing your puppet mouth using only your thumb. Now, you can engage your wrist every now and then to help open the puppet mouth even wider so you can take advantage of the full range of motion in your hand. And always remember, keep everything relaxed but controlled. Try practicing in the mirror. You can say the alphabet, count to 20, sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. You can practice lip syncing to your favorite songs, in conversations with friends, during job interviews. The possibilities are endless. And before you know it, your lip sync will become second nature. Now, see, Dad, Peter just explained it. No fake ads. He just came right out and said what it is you need to do. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Peter. And uh, I'd like to thank Good Lip Sync for being a sponsor of Below the Frame. Fake. <laughs> Before the break, we were talking with Bill Beretta about how he blew an audition and it was like getting punched in the head. So let's pick up right where we left off. You didn't get that job, but you did get, yeah. you got some acting gigs. Not a lot. I was more, you know, and actually just leading up to the, the, um, the New York thing, again, Gene was always creating things. And so we would do in, like industrial videos mm -hmm. with a twist to them, yeah. you know? Try and put some like fun training films, you yeah. know. Uh, two, well, I say two, four other friends of ours, of Gene and I, we, we all worked at Sesame Place and we ended up creating training videos for Sesame Place. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, two guys named oh, Mark McCorkle and Bob Schooley, who now are amazing uh, executive producers and a writing team for Disney and Nickelodeon. They did Kim Possible. Wow. Big Hero 6, uh, Buzz Lightyear, like, oh, you know, uh, Pe uh, Penguins of Madagascar. Mm -hmm. This kind of team back in Pennsylvania, these guys, they were part of it. My friend Michael Newton, who's a producer for films, who out, lives out here as well in California. He's, he was a producer for my production company. We mm -hmm. are writing partners as well. Wow. Um, another guy, Jeff Santoro, who was my production company partner. Yeah, uh, and Gene. So the five of us made these training videos at Sesame uh -huh. Place, and they—I think they still use some of them today. Oh man, I'd love to see those. But they're—I'll oh, have to show them to you. Sometime. I'd love to see them. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. But you're doing so, some. Oh, so, so that was some work. That yeah, was some like work. some paid work, you know. Yeah. But in New York, I didn't do a theater. Sh I didn't do a show, anything. I went to school, worked, and then when school was over, I decided to move to LA. What year was this? What when was this? 1990. So 1990, you decided to move to LA to be an actor. Yeah. Yes, I guess right. You go out and be an actor. Did you get an agent? Did you have an agent at any no. point in there? Or you, no. You just moved out. To, Never had an agent actually. Really? Yeah. Just moved out and uh, moved out to LA. Move, You're out here, out moved there. Moved out. My cousin had a house that she was she was moving out of, and she was going to rent. And I rented it in Long Beach, North Long Beach. So I lived in North Long Beach, which is, you know, about as far as you can get from Hollywood in Los Angeles, you know. Yeah. And I would, um, I had a carpentry job. I had another waitering carpentry job. Carpentry job. You, I did. Did you know how, how did you know how to do carpentry? Well, I, I knew something about electricity because I worked for a lamp store one time. So oh, I God. learned about that and I would go on jobs and help you know, learn about how to do yeah. electricity stuff. And then the carpentry stuff, I didn't really know it until I started working with this guy. And then mm -hmm. I was like an apprentice and I would go to his sites and I learned how to build stuff, you know, build houses. So, so you're out there in LA, was it dinosaurs for the Jim Henson company? Was that the that first thing first you did? Big, that was my first big thing, yeah. Well, how did that come about? I mean, I would assume it has something to do with Brian. You you knew it Brian does. and so yeah. how did that happen? So when Jim, Jim passed away in 90, right? And I was still in New York and I was on my way to school and uh, I'm on my way and I, somebody's reading a newspaper and it says Sammy Davis Jr. dies. And then they turned it and I saw it said Jim Henson died. I was like, what? Oh my God. And Brian and I had been in touch. We had phone numbers, you know, over the years. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like stunned and I didn't, I didn't get off at my spot. I ended up downtown and I thought, I'm just going to call him. I got out and I called him. And his wife at the time, Ellis, answered, and 
She said, why don't you come here, you know? And I said, okay. And uh, so I went back uptown and I went to the, where Jim's place at the Sherry Netherlands was. And I yeah. went there and uh, Brian and Ellis and I think Cheryl was there and Jane was there. And I just hung out with them and, and, and it was all very, um, I don't want to say it didn't set in, but if Jane was very cordial and sweet and kind and open, like she was open, you know, mm -hmm. she was she was worried about everybody else, right? You know, and that's kind of how the kids were too. Like it was, it, you know, and the people weren't thinking of themselves; they were thinking about others. Yeah, and, and uh, I thought that was really amazing. And so I just stayed, you know, a little bit. A little while just to see how he was okay and and then we just started to stay in touch i went to the memorial and yeah you know and then i moved out to california so i'm out there what maybe six or seven months in california and brian's calls he says i'm coming to la you want to get together i was like yeah come to the house you know come and hang out mm -hmm. so he comes down to north long beach and we just start messing around and laughing and having some fun being stupid <laughs> and he said you know i'm doing this uh I'm working on this show, and uh, I said, "Well, I would love to. I'll come and sweep floors or move cables. I don't care. You know, I just yeah. want to be around it." And he said, "Well, there's this because I guess Ninja Turtles was out already." Yeah. He said, "It's like that. What we did in Ninja Turtles, where there's people in these suits." He said, "I don't." He said, "It's really hard. I don't know if you, it's something you want to do." I was like, "Yeah, I'll whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Sure, I'll audition. You know, whatever." Uh -huh. He said, "Okay, you sure?" I was like, "Yeah." And uh, so I, I, so it's about dinosaurs. So I learned what it's about. Yeah. And I hear that the character's kind of like Jackie Gleason uh, from the Honeymooners. Yeah. You know. And I used to do him as a kid, and I'm thinking, okay, I can kind of find that. Yeah. And then I thought, okay, I'm I'm going as I have to do this audition. How am I going to do this dinosaur thing? So I I didn't know what he looked like. So in my mind, it was like a, a T Rex. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, have my hands kind of here <laughs> and be kind of long and, and do the, you know, the cigar stuff. And then I shaved my head so that I would have that kind of reptilian head, yeah. you know, neck look. And that's what I went and that's how I auditioned. <laughs> oh, my, with a shaved head. And I think Brian maybe was reading the offlines because when we first started Dinosaurs, he was working with me. He did the head. He was operating the head. And I think uh -huh. he was thinking maybe he was going to do it. But as the executive producer, I think he realized he just couldn't, you know, do yeah. that. Yeah. Which is then when I met Dave Gulls. But uh, <laughs> so, so, but yeah, so that was my first big thing. And I auditioned and fortunately, Michael Jacobs and Brian was like, you know what? I can't, I can't decide. I'm going to let them decide because I'd feel weird, I think, about, yeah. you know, picking you, even though he said, I'd like you to do it. I want them to, and they, fortunately, they picked me to do it. Wow. And it was the most amazing show ever, man. It was, Crazy. it's, I, as a fan of that show, it was, your performance as Earl is so, I mean, there's some great physical stuff. I can't imagine how heavy those. Oh, thanks. Well, he was, I think we, we weighed it. He was 85 pounds total. His head was like 25 or something. Oh, God. And then John Criswell, who worked at the workshop, found, discovered carbon fiber uh -huh. uh, for us and made a head that, Made it at like 18 pounds or something, which was awesome. It's pretty know. good. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say thank you for the compliment. My first year, I sucked, right? So well, my first season, I thought it was the worst because I was big, right? My yeah. movements were big and they were too much. Like I was trying to do too much. And, and the reason I loved the thing was because I had just come from Meisner, which was all about interpreting dialogue through behavior. Mm -hmm. right, that's the Meisner thing. You're, you're doing the behavior. Here's the script. You learn the script verbatim, and then you forget about it. And then you, what you do is you then live in the moment, and your behavior tells the story as the words are riding on top mm -hmm. of that. Important words, yeah. but that, that's kind of how the, you know, the blend, and it feels natural and real. Right. And so I thought, interpreting dialogue through behavior. This is perfect. <laughs> I'm in the suit. Yeah. Somebody else is stay, saying the words. Yeah. Right, somebody else is doing the the mouth movements and the and the facial expressions. I'm moving the head and the neck, and it's all about behavior. This is cool, and it was. It was really mm -hmm. cool, you yeah. know, because we had we had headphones in there, and we had a microphone, and I could hear the puppeteer who was doing the head, and they could hear me, 
and we could also hear everybody else in the scene. So sometimes uh-huh. there's 12 people oh. commu- 12, you know, communicating, trying to talk through each other, and yeah. uh, which was really cool because then we'd get laughing too. Sometimes it was great, sometimes it was <laughs> annoying. But so what I so the note I got that I think made the rest of the series better was from Frank. Frank came to visit and uh, he said he said you know he said I love you know I love the character but you might want to touch his chin every once in a while you know connect connect the head to the body a little more because up till that point it was the head yeah and the body were like separate. You know, I didn't do a lot of like leaning on the head uh-huh. or just scratching the chin for a second, you know, and that just, and that just made sense. That was just, that was it. Then I realized I was doing way too much and it was too separated and I had to simplify because he was also saying simplify, you yeah. know, you're, you're doing too much. And so then I think it got better. And, and actually, you know, the first season Dave and I, so Dave Goals came, mm-hmm. so we had Dave on it, right? Steve, oh, man, Kevin. Geez. Uh, you know, I mean, the list goes on of great puppeteers, but like the Muppet performers, you know, there's three right there, Mm -hmm. you know, of the kind of core group that are working on it. So I'm hanging with those guys. Dave is doing it with me, which was so much fun, except he eventually, I think, I think it was a combination of things. Maybe, you know, Jim had just passed. And so it was, all that was still kind of going on for everybody. Yeah. And then I think it was this, you know, he's doing the animatronic thing. I'm not sure if he loved it so much. Yeah, you know, I, doing I the think Waldo. Felt, was it a Waldo? Is it that what it yeah, is? Yeah, Waldo with the joystick and the. Yeah. And I think he didn't feel as connected as he wanted to be to yeah. the whole character. You know, I get that. And then he would hear me inside. You know, passing out. Sometimes I would faint, and <laughs> I think it freaked <laughs> him out. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I bet it did. Or sometimes oh. me going, God damn, <laughs> you know, me pissed off, sweating yeah. in there. You know, so <sighs> I think he got tired of that. Probably that's probably the real reason. That's he probably what it was. <laughs> yeah, and then Mac Wilson came mm-hmm. and and did the rest of it, and he was you know Mac's phenomenal. His his animatronic work is unbelievable, and I think you'd have to ask him. But I mean, I would we do a scene, and the only way I could see is if they opened the mouth, right? That's the only way I, I could see any anywhere. Yeah, and so we'd do a scene. I'd sit down, and we'd open the mouth, and I could watch a monitor out there, and it was like I was almost watching my face because I was inside. I'm doing this, you know. I'm yeah, yeah. Doing all this stuff, and before we would shoot, we would rehearse without the heads on. So I had the big costume, right? And I'd but no head, and I would do this. This he would talk off, you know, just off the set. They everybody would. They do yeah. their characters' voices, and we would block it. And you know, I would do the thing, and I think he was watching my face, and he Maybe. would start to, you know, put yeah. stuff in there. And uh, it was really, got really fun. And we started to really get tight. And I knew what he was going to do, and he knew what I was going to do. And it was like split-second stuff. And so, so great to know, have that collaboration with somebody that you're working so in sync like that. Yeah, yeah. It just uh, it kind of came together and it worked easy. and, and Not easy, but it, it was just a good match. You know, and like, like uh, Kevin Clash had John Kennedy doing the eyes. Yeah. And those two were perfect. They could yep. anticipate just just at the right moment. They could find everybody started to find their groove, you know. Yeah, Leaf Tilden, Michelle Insisti, Dave Greenaway, Alan Troutman, Bruce Lenoyle, yeah, you know, Julian oh, Busher. I mean, just endless talent. Ricky Boyd, Brian, yeah. it was amazing. Tom Fisher, Jack Tate, wow, Tony Prince, amazing people. And- That's just the people performing. The crew was phenomenal. The writers. Were amazing, and to yeah. have that experience, you know, I mean, the, it was a successful show. You did how many seasons? Four seasons, Six, sixty-five. Yeah, just they wanted to, it. Was it was so expensive? They were like, let's just get syndication. Yeah, you know, let's just get to that point, and uh, and we did. We got. I think we did sixty-five total. Wow, yeah. it yeah. was a great show. It got better and better. You know, the Disney kind of backed off a little bit and started to let us do things and not didn't worry so much like they did the first season, which you know, of course they're. Throwing a lot of money at this thing, and it would yeah. never happen without them. But uh, you know, they people just started to let us do it, and and it just got and trust. Just got trust you guys. Yeah. At, at this point, you're doing that show, but there's also times when you're not doing that show. Are you are you thinking now? Okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do that thing that they they do. Or are you still thinking? I'm going to be an actor. 
No, so uh, again, I'm, 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 I know that we are actors. Absolutely, what we do is acting. Yeah, yeah. But it's a different, no, know you know, you. like a body actor. Yeah, as a per, as yourself, a person as yourself. Yeah. Uh, yes, I still wanted to do that, mm-hmm. and I didn't really like occasionally when I wasn't performing Earl, which he was in it a lot, you know. Yeah. So it wasn't often, but occasionally I would do a background character puppet because we also had dinosaur puppets, yeah. or I would assist somebody because I wanted to just see what that was like and have fun. And Kevin was a really helpful in that way that he always you know, would let me do stuff if I was interested or I was mm-hmm. into it. He was like, yeah, come on, come do it. And so little bits, I started to, you know, play around with it. And then as we were coming towards the end of it, I think I think the first three years, well, what we were really in it for three and a half years, I guess. But yeah, about the first two and a half to three years, um, I was just about relaxing when I yeah. wasn't doing it. I mean, I was exhausted, you know. Yeah. And so I wasn't, there was, I didn't do anything else, I think, the rest of the year except recuperate and enjoy life for a little while. Because we did, we did 12 to 16 hour days, yeah. you know, six days a week. With I mean, 85 a, pounds on you. Yeah. And, and, and it was a grueling schedule because, you know, there's that thing they call turnaround, right? Right. So we go in at 8 a.m. and we'd work 13 hours. And now the turnaround pushed you a little bit later the next day. So by the end of the week, you're working until four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So your clock's just a mess. You know, yeah. your body clock's a mess. Oh, you know what was cool actually about that time? Mm-hmm. We shot at MTM Studios, uh, which is now CBS over in the Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was the Mary Tyler Moore Studios. And the other shows that were shooting at the same time on the lot. Wow. It's Seinfeld, Roseanne, Evening Shade, and I think a, a Different World, I think. Wow. Uh, oh, and Larry Sanders was Jeez. next door. So that's where I met Jeffrey Tambor for the first time. He would oh, come really? over and watch us, uh, oh. and then I would go over and watch them, you know. Wow. But it was a, this, this, dude, this yeah. studio was amazing. It's a hopping was, studio, a lot of classic <laughs> shows there. And I just happened to have a parking space next to Jerry Seinfeld, so I would see him every morning, you know, hey, hi. But yeah, it was wow. a cool just time, you know, the, it was a really fun time. My, one of my, I think it's still my favorite time because we all worked so hard. The workshop, the hardest, they worked the hardest. Oh, like they would have to lug these things up from <laughs> a stage that's, you know, 500 yards away or two football fields, whatever it is, and they'd have to bring all that on the carts and unload it, and then we'd all sweat in Put it. Put you in it and yeah, clean get us your in. sweat out of it. Oh, the, we stunk uh, and change <laughs> at lunchtime, and then yeah. they dry the air, you know, with a dryer. Then at night, after you're done, if you think you're tired, four o'clock in the morning, yeah, right. they're bringing they're all this still stuff going. back. Oh, I my know. God. Our, our wranglers in our workshop work so hard. They are unbelievable. Un- unbelievable. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, as Dinosaurs ended, I did a little, I was asked to come and join, I think it was Muppet Classic Theater, I think, and I did an Elvis puppet, uh-huh. an yeah. elf, elf, Elvis. And I think that was the first kind of thing I did. And so then little, I think we did a Kokomo video, Kermit, the Muppets sang Kokomo. Mm-hmm. And I did some background characters. And then... What happened? Was it Muppet Treasure Island then? But I think we did the Animal Show first. I think the animal first show. season of the Animal Show. What did you do on the Animal Show? That was where I was kind of then thrown in, right? So, so yeah. here, here's here's your opportunity to to sink or swim. Yep. And the first season of it, I did like twenty characters guests. So we had guests come on. So you maybe so you're playing stink- a porcupine one day, or you're playing. It's all animals that they've done. They're, you'll see live video of it, but then you'll also have a puppet version of that that talks. Right, exactly. And so you had Stinky and Jake. So you had Dave Goles as a skunk, and Steve is this hysterical bear. Yeah. And they were the host, and they would have guests on. Mm-hmm. And um, so I would do the guests. Some of the guests there was, and Louise was on it, and Karen Prell did it. Mac Wilson as well. Um, John Eccleston was on it. And it was my first time working with Peter Harris, director of The Muppet Show. Yeah. And his style was amazing. Such a, a kind of, knows exactly what he's looking for, um, but is hard. Like, you better get it right. Wow. You know, no time to f around. I'm right. doing this. We've, we only got this many takes. 
if you don't get it, darling, I'm, I want you over the fucking stage. You know, sometimes he would lose. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just passionate. He's just a passionate yeah. guy, you know? And so uh, Stinky and Jake had this um, counter or their, or their desk. Mm-hmm. And behind it, where we were, was just this kind of curved wall. And we would tape up all of the pages of the script. It was like wallpaper. Yeah. A- and we would literally, I would come in with Mike, and here he is, uh, somebody, the, you know, alligator. And I would come <laughs> in and, uh, hey, how you doing? Hey, welcome. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, thanks. Great to be here. Hey, just tell us about yourself. Well, blah, 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 blah. And then in real time, they would then on our screens run footage that Jim Lewis and Jocelyn Stevenson had to go through because they wrote all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Yeah. Um, and they wrote really funny stuff that would go with the footage. And we would read through, like staying ready. So when they would come back with the camera, <laughs> we'd be ready, you know. <laughs> yep. And hopefully we could get through it. We didn't, obviously. But yeah. it, we were, pre- you know, it was like, here you go. This is your training. Yeah. Can you stay in the moment? Are you looking in the right place at the right time when the camera oh. comes back? Can you adjust real quick, you know, yeah. to make sure you're not messing it up? Can you keep it funny? Can you make it feel moment to moment? You know, can it, can you create yeah. enough characters? Right. You know? And, you know, by the second season, I was out of characters. I was basically doing, you know, I had an idea of what the, like the character was, but vocally I was just changing octaves. You know, so it was, I was like, you know, you have Marlon Brando doing it. Like one character's like this, but he's an yeah. octopus. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the next time you do a guy like this, but he's still Marlon Brando. Yeah, he's still a little Marlon Brando. And then, and then you have like a little weasel, baby. He'd be like, hey, he's all Marlon yeah. Brando. You know, You're kind of going through the uh, ages of Marlon Brando, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just wow. trying to find these, you know, voices. But you also, also played sorry, Dave. Kind of, the human, didn't yes, you? Yes, that was fun. You played I the Dave Goals yeah. puppet. They went and did a remote at Dave Goals house. Yeah, but you the played the puppet version of him. Yeah, right. Yeah, How I did. did you, I mean, it was fun. He was he was the only human on the you know on the <laughs> on the guests list. <laughs> it's so fitting. Um, it was I you know I just did him. I don't know. I just yeah. imitated him. You know, it's, yes. it's really great. You know, yes, that handshake that he does in real oh, he life. Gets so when excited. He's like, oh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the puppet yeah. does that too. It's so funny. And that was fun. you did that and show. That was my and training that, ground. That was your your throwing you in the deep end. Yeah. Well, then I started to feel a little more comfortable technically. Like I felt this is interesting for puppeteers. I think you know, mm-hmm. and maybe not for all for everybody, but some. But so I felt really comfortable doing characters, right? Yeah. Because I would do them as myself, like Johnny Fiamma I did as myself before it became a puppet, and um, so I was very comfortable with that stuff. Technically, terrible, right? I'd never done it. Right. So as I got, as I got, as I focused more technically, and got better, my characters got worse. You know, right? Because I yeah. couldn't, couldn't I hold on to yeah. it. You know that, right? I yeah, mean, we all do it's, that. It's either one way or the other. I think there are some people that are like they're really technically amazing, but then their characters they don't they have to get there somehow. They got to somehow up that yep. side of it. And you're yep. looking for this they have kind to of work balance. That. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Right. So, so you know, so so we're yeah. that's what that's what was interesting for me. I, I didn't realize that that was going to be the process. I was like, "What's yeah. wrong with my acting?" You know, <laughs> I'm so yeah. boring and flat and dull. I, I can't get it because I'm worried about what I'm doing here. And so it took me a, obviously a long time to you know f- try and find that balance. And I think we still do it, right? We still absolutely. There are moments when you're like, what the heck? I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, we're doing five different things at once. Yeah. And so I think we're always trying to find the right balance of that. But, you know, there was that period where it's just awful. And then, oh, we're getting a little Uh, better. Getting there. Uh, Bill, stop right there. Uh, We have to pause and ask a puppeteer about not puppets. Ask a puppeteer about not puppets. On today's installment of Ask a Puppeteer About Not Puppets, we're talking with Carmen Osbar. So, Carmen... Have you ever broken any bones? Yes. What? Where? Where? What'd you break? Like eight times. What? Yeah. What did you break? Of course. Well, when I was little, I used to climb trees. Uh, but- so I was climbing a tree and I fell and I broke my arm uh, in three parts. Then oh, man. Uh, probably, yeah, two years after, I, I, I broke my leg playing volleyball. Oh. Yeah. 
And then like a year after, you know, but you have a daughter that that it happens to her when you're in sports. Yeah, but nobody's I, broken bones like that. That's insane. Oh my God. And yeah, even I broke a bone in Sesame. was like, you know, remember with a grape around the craft service? I, I broke a bone in my, in my Ugh. foot. Yeah, uh, all so, the time. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. They heal. Yeah. That's the puppeteer about my puppets. Okay, we're back with Bill Beretta, and we were talking about Animal Show. What came after that? And then, so after Animal Show was Treasure Island. Yeah, and I would say you, for Clueless Morgan, you were definitely on this character equaled to your uh, technical skills. He's so funny. Well, that's nice to hear. I didn't, I didn't feel that way then. Oh, my gosh. It is so funny. Yeah. He is. I love those dumb characters. I mean, he's mm. a dumb, he's just a dumb character, <laughs> right? I, well, mean, I mean, that's, that's how I of, see him. kind I of don't, insulting. <laughs> I don't kind mean that. Insulting. Like, you probably didn't feel... <laughs> <laughs> Would I say that you're a dumb character? <laughs> no. Because you might be. I know, People I'm might sorry. think it. I didn't People might mean... think you're stupid. <laughs> they already do. But, it, you know, I mean, I just think those are so fun to play and so fun well, to yeah. watch. And I feel like Clueless Morgan is, oh, so yeah. just good. I think it's. I think it's somebody that has no real accountability, you know, or, and has no real <laughs> sense of reality. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they're in their own world, and 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 sometimes they come back for a second. You know, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was I was thinking about uh, Cracker Jacks, and or you know whatever it is, and, yeah. and now oh yeah, I'm supposed to be I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> you know, that's a uh, fun movie. Yeah. Was that fun to work on that movie? It must have been hard. Oh, yeah. though. Well, it was my first movie. Yeah, you know, so I was just in heaven. I mean, a and movie you shot in England. It in, moving it, yeah, you shot it in England. Wow, that's cool. Oh my god! And I got to drive to work every day with Kevin. Ah, wait, <laughs> he drove? <laughs> or, <laughs> no, not really. That okay. was the problem. Is that he hit just about everything oh, on the way? Boy. He was like, Bill, Bill, come on, Bill, come with me, come on, we're gonna, come on, Bill, Bill. I was like, Kevin, let me drive. I'm driving, driving, I'm driving. Uh-huh. Boom! He like took so by the end of the the movie, his rental didn't have a, a, a mirror on one side. <laughs> <laughs> the front bumper was dented because every morning we would come in, there was a pole for his parking spot. He hit that thing regularly every morning. But yeah, so I I I got to spend a lot of time with Kevin and more time with the guys, mm-hmm. and one of my idol idol actors, Tim Curry, yeah. to be in his presence is something that is just nothing like it nothing wow. like it he is unbelievable he's given a hundred percent it seems like oh. like for oh everything my God. i don't know if it is it feels like it to me you know maybe it's not for him who knows yeah, maybe, I mean, not. He's, maybe he's not i don't know it sure but feels he, like but he's like there he's he's unbelievable and kind and he was thrilled to be a part of it at times, he was like, it's exhausting mm-hmm. to do a movie with the Muppets as a yeah. human, right? It is, I'm sure. I mean, sure. to stand up on things and not be worried that you're going to fall and yep. waiting for puppets, you know. Yeah, waiting for us to get our arms up in the air and all yeah. of us, or, however many or there we're are. tired. That take didn't work because the eye didn't blink, <sighs> you know, and Tim's thinking. Yeah. I was good. Mother <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but the cast was great. So we had a great cast. We had an amazing director. Brian was unbelievable. Amazing director. I don't know how he did that movie. Kevin Bishop was just a boy, just a sweet boy, mischievous kid. Yeah, you know. And then he came and he back so, and he did the O2 shows with us. He which did was our show so together, much fun. right? I know, right? That was great. But back then he was a kid, and uh, but a good actor, and he was like a little bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> like always, move. He was always, you know, full of energy. Yeah. And Tim was like, be sitting there smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Kevin, just a moment, just a moment. Hey, 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 what do you think? What do you think if we do this? Do you do you want to do this? And then he'd be like, Kevin would be upside down, like you know, jumping over the pit. <laughs> Woo! And and then, <laughs> and wow. Tim's just kind of like, oh dear God. And so at some point, I think maybe it was near the end of the shoot, they made a Tim Curry puppet. And they made a Kevin Bishop puppet, and Steve and I did them uh-huh. you know, just like, before we presented it to uh, them. So they each cool. got one. 
but they had a it was just a funny relationship watching them together you did that movie and then was muppets tonight not long after that yeah, so while we were there, I guess, I don't know when it, the deal was made, but I guess Muppets Tonight was going to happen. So we did workshops in England before we came home. Character workshops? Just trying to yeah. find new find characters? Find new characters, yeah. And is that so, where, out of that, Pepe and, and uh, Bobo and Johnny Fiamma as a puppet version? And, uh, yeah, Frank was with us as well. And so basically they brought in just a big rack of puppets, of characters that really weren't used that much or were, you know, some more supporting characters or background characters maybe yeah. haven't been used a lot. And uh, we would just, we set up a camera and then we'd just grab something and Frank would just interview us and we would just see what happened. Yeah. And so like Pepe, who, you know, is based on my wife's, uh, Christine's aunt, and um, yeah. he that was just a wire thing. It was not a complete puppet. It just had... It was it was just like I don't know what it was. It just had little eyes, and it had a flappy mouth, little wire mouth. <laughs> and I just grabbed that. I think it had some fur on its body, maybe. Uh -huh. And that's what I started doing that with, just to mess around to see what that was. And then Johnny Fiamma, would, we actually had a puppet that looked like Charlie Rifkin, who was with Henson at the time. And I he was I used him for the Johnny Fiamma thing a little bit. Howard Tubman mm -hmm. was I just grabbed this boar. It was it was him, but he was a boar. Yeah. And, you know, Frank was asking questions. And, and I just thought, I want to do something opposite. He was dressed like a Viking yeah. <laughs> or yeah. something. And I just went the complete the other opposite way. with yeah. him, you know, just have fun. But, yeah, so that was like a fun little workshop that we did to try and find some stuff. And so those came out of it, yeah, those characters. And performing Pepe, what are, we have heard the story, like it's it's based on Christina's aunt. It's enough already, right? Right? You know, we we know that Jesus story. Christ. But but he is a very small yeah. puppet. There's some dexterity that has to come in in operating him you know i guess i'm just uh, talking technique here yeah well um you know i learned a lot from steve with rizzo i think yeah i watched him a lot and he does a lot with the attitude you know he didn't he didn't he doesn't even have rizzo doesn't have a, a up and down head mm -hmm. you know movement which yeah which i feel is a good something that helps pepe it gives pepe that kind of oh, yeah. like you know that's part of his attitude so that helped me a lot. But Steve's manipulation of Rizzo is just oh crazy gosh. for just such a simple puppet. I know, it know? really is. And if you really look at it, just like the tiny little movements mean Small. so much. And, and so I think brilliant. it was about that, about thinking about keeping it simple, you yeah. know, not not going big because he is little. Maybe that is it. And, and just keeping everything simple, small, just moving the mouth when he talks, not a whole lot of, you know, yeah. this because he could easily be doing that. So I'm trying not to get his head to go up while he's talking, because my hand is around that dowel in there, you know, yeah. so it can easily kind of slip it up. So I'm trying up. not to do that, right? You know, <laughs> until I need it. But I just, yeah, I guess it's just little thing. I mean, it's small, I guess, simple, yeah. small. You've taken over several of Jim Henson's roles: Doctor Teeth and uh, Rolf and Swedish mm -hmm. Chef and Mana Mana, and uh, and then you've also been able to create your own. I mean, that's nowadays for us. It, it's rare that we get to create new characters. Yeah. We're, we're now yeah. kind of at the point where we're taking on legacy characters. And can you say, like, what you think uh, your, the what differences you, are? You've done phenomenally. Oh, I mean, the, and, and, the, and the, the spectrum of the, what you've taken on. Big Bird, uh, The uh, Count, uh, uh, Kermit, Floyd. Uh, I mean, it's a range, Matt. It's phenomenal. It we're is, so fortunate to yeah. have this group. You know, that somehow we found each other and, 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 or not found each other, but that the connection that I guess Jim established, right? Yeah. Somehow we're just, it be, I don't know. I don't know how. We're this how, where crazy did, how, where puzzle. Eric, how I don't did know. Eric happen? I don't know. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, how could, who, who else could do what Frank Oz does? It's unbelievable. You know, it's yeah. crazy. In creating these roles, what what do you think is like the, a difference between, you know, creating a character that, that you're creating and taking over a legacy character? Well, I think the difference is one is is you and, and the other is only it can only be a part of you. Right. So, yeah, I don't think it could ever be your character. Right. So you're you're doing your for me. This is me. Right. So with Rolf or the chef or Dr. Teeth, I'm doing, you know, at the best impression I can but it's more about the essence of the character as opposed to exactly the voice. So I focus right. on 
what I, because I think I understand character better than I'm not like the best vocal artist, but I think right. I understand character. So if I can find the essence of that, yes. then I think we're paying tribute and we're kind of keeping that alive, right? Yeah. As far as my other, the other bits are, they are part of me, right? So yeah. Pepe is is a part of me, even though his characteristics are based on my wife's aunt and, and, and it's part of her as well, but my interpretation of her, you yeah. know, in a fun way. Same mm -hmm. with Johnny Fiamma's my dad and my grandfather mixed, but that's also yeah. a part of me. You know, that's right. Bobo is probably me, you know, for the most part. <laughs> you know, I think he's the most like, um, I, I kind of always like say that I feel like I'm a lot like Bobo or Bobo's like me because he's just grateful that nobody's uh -huh. realized that he shouldn't just be in a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I've been allowed to do this. Yeah, how are we like, like I know, I know what you're saying. Don't you let him, I hope uh, you don't figure it out. <laughs> I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'm yeah. here. Uh, I'm not going to make a ruckus. I'm, I'm not going to ruffle any feathers. Just, I don't, I just they don't know I'm a bear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I get it. So that's, I think that's the difference is that yeah. characters you create are a part of you. Characters mm -hmm. we haven't created, we're paying tribute to and we're trying to create the essence of as best we can to keep them alive and 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 then I think you I think it it has it has to become a part of you as well. So so right. it's you can't just be Jim's Rolf. You have right. to grow still because I it think has to characters have to grow. But I think if you have to, it's that that's the fine line that some people I think get and some people don't. Is that yeah. you got to realize where to, where am I stepping over the line and where mm -hmm. can I push it a little and grow without it feeling invasive or off the mark. Yeah. And sometimes and you sometimes, go off the mark. Yeah. Sometimes you maybe go a little too far and then you pull it, you, feel, yeah. you realize it and you pull it back. And, or or sometimes know. we're asked to do things that we don't agree with and we don't have the, you know, the power to, to, to make those choices ultimately. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, that's true. not our doing. We, we kind of, it's out of our hands at times. Um, so yeah. that's that's a frustrating thing about it. It but, is, but yeah. which comes from yeah. not really owning the characters. We don't own them; they're somebody else's characters, and we are charged with performing those yeah. characters for for them. Yeah, and so the argument could always be, "Well, but you're not Jim." Yeah, you know? right. And you go, "Well, okay, yeah, mm, yeah well, absolutely yeah. right." I mean, you're right. that's really right. I'm, <laughs> I've been doing it for almost yeah. you know twenty five years or something. But but you're right. But it's, you're right. That's not. Yeah. But then well, then there's the opportunities when we are given that, yeah, you given know, that and, freedom. And because we're trusted to stay true to them and that's what we yeah. try our best to do, right? Yeah. Do you have a favorite character that you like to perform? I hate that question. I know, I do too. Because my, my answer is usually, well, I want to hear what you, what, what you say. No, go ahead. My answer is usually, well, I mean, it depends. Like, I like all of them for different reasons because they are that's all either part of me or part of somebody that I loved or, some, you know, they're, that's, that's my yep. answer. That's fine. Me too. You know? It's really just... I like them for different reasons at different yeah. times. So I don't. I don't really have a favorite. I just they, I enjoy them in the moment if it's working and it's fun yeah. and we're laughing. Do you have one that you a character that you identify the best with? No, I, I mean I think in identify with. I think I identify with Bobo probably the most. Yeah. The other ones I have to I think work at harder. Pepe mm -hmm. has to have an accent and he's and he's he's a prick, you know, and yeah. I gotta be that, you know, gotta in a go fun there. way. Make it entertaining, but go to that place of me, and then Johnny Fiamma's, uh, you know, he's like a, an idiot, <laughs> not an idiot, but he's just uh, self-absorbed, and yeah. uh, and I have to go to that kind of, you know, that just, that false arrogance kind of thing or yeah. something. But yeah, I think Boba probably that's who I identify the most with. You've done so many other things. You you co-wrote the Henson Creature Shop film Jack and the Beanstalk, right? I did. did you you co-wrote it. Did. Then you, I did. Did you? All, you also played the the giant. The giant Thunderdome. Right? Yeah. You, I begged for it actually. You did. Meg Brian, because I wrote it. I was like Brian. I know Come this on. guy. You gotta let me do it because there's two different ones. I thought this is so much fun. I get to do two different characters. You know, yeah. there's the there's the benevolent sweet giant, and then there's the, you know. And and I and I and I wanted to put Brando in it like a little bit, so that's what the giant was. Yeah, you know? yeah. And a little bit of him, and then uh, you know the other one was just you know <laughs> kind of that 
uh, old, you know, fun kind of bad, I don't know, just, you know, just I bad. just had so much fun doing it and the makeup. And then you got to play the lead in, in Happy Time Murders. And Happy Brian Time directed Murders. that. I, and and a Kimmy Schmidt, I had fun doing that. Oh, that gosh, yeah, yeah. Too. That's that was fun to do. That's a funny character. And you've done... Um, Tons of other other things as a as a producer, and you've directed mm. tons of things. You're the Muppet captain for the Disney Muppets. Mm. You know what? Yeah. What do you think? You know, being a Muppet captain myself, general. I want to ask you this. Oh, you're I like a general. To make sure I, I like to make sure. Yeah, that people wow. is a, I'm a general at this point. You're a general. Well, yeah. okay. So then I need to know this. What are, <laughs> what do you think the big hurdles are for you when you're working with people who've maybe never worked with Muppets before? The f- first big issue is that no matter how much experience you've had in what you do, whether you're a director, a writer, a producer, a cameraman, a gaffer, best boy, no matter if, no matter how much you've done, if you've never done a Muppet related show, you have no idea what you're in for until you do it. So we could talk about it all day long. We could sit there and we could look at blueprints and we could Mm -hmm. talk about how we're going to shoot this and how we're going to shoot that. But until you do it, it doesn't make sense. You right. think it does, right? Yep. And so there's a, just a misconception from the get-go that everybody knows what's going on. And nobody does. <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that's true. And people try and reinvent the wheel at times, yep. right? That's another hard thing because you've done it so much yeah. that you know you've seen this happen. You've seen somebody try and reinvent how oh, we sure. should shoot this, right? Yeah. And we see them go through the exercise, and you just have to do it. You have to be patient right. and let people go through these things and not bang your head against the wall, although sometimes I have. <laughs> but you have to just let people go through it. And so what I always say at the beginning of a production is I say, guys, whether you believe me or not, the first two to three weeks is a learning curve. Mm-hmm. So make sure you've put enough time into the production and the budget to know that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to be learning how this is done. And yeah. some people get a little quicker. Some don't. Some never do. Some never get it. <laughs> you know? But, yeah. but know that that's coming. And they go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Puppet let's captain, shoot. sure. You know? Yeah. And uh, so I think that's the biggest thing. It's, it's our Muppet learning curve. It I is. There is a big Muppet learning curve. Yeah. But when yeah. it works, when you, everybody's there and everybody's got it, mm-hmm. it's like the best. Yeah. I mean, and it's happened, you know, it, it's happened quite a lot, you know. Yeah. And But after that learning curve, when you're in the groove, like you're saying, it's it's so much fun. I feel like we finally got there on the, the ABC Muppet series. Where, we did. You know what I mean? Like, because I was terrified of more than one camera at a time and figuring oh, out, yeah. and, and we all, we were a little bit handheld, uh, yeah, handheld, and just being, uh, and it took some some of us going, okay, we'll try that, yep. and because that's how they, you know, the way just it wanted go to be for shot, it. and then we Let's went see for what it. happens. Yeah, and, and I think and it, it was it had it was really a learning cool. curve for us. Yeah, it was our learning curve along with yeah. them. We we yeah. all had a learning curve, but it, I think yeah. it ended up looking really great. It was just the first what I'd say the first, well again, the first three weeks, yeah. or maybe even four, was about everybody figuring out how we were doing this and getting a crew and directors who hadn't done it. You know, well it's not not the crew, the crew had done it. Yeah, directors hadn't. A lot of the writers hadn't written for Muppets. So that was new to them, and, and you know what, you know, as you're writing, you you sometimes troubleshoot things because you realize, yes, we could try anything. Let's try anything. Right. right? Always open to that, but even within that, you can troubleshoot some things that you think, oh, that's not going to look so good. Yeah. Well, that's going to take a lot longer than you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we talk about this way of doing it? You know, but nobody had that knowledge, so right. I think that was a learning curve for them yeah. as well. I had a fun time mm. working on that show. I'd never worked oh. on a series like that. Oh, know, right. You know, yeah, a yeah. primetime TV show like that. I think we had a great time on the set. We did. Whenever we were shooting, that was the best. You yeah. know, not everything translated from upstairs, but no. but I think whenever we were on the stage, or anybody came on the stage, it was just great. Yeah. It was, it was really good. Speaking of a fun time, I just want to talk just a little bit about Muppet Guys that When you got drunk? Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. We don't talk about that. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and I'm drunk now. Anyway, the I want to talk about Muppet Guys talking because 
Oh. Uh, what was it like? What, being what the there? hell was I doing what, there? What, what were you there for? <laughs> no. <laughs> what was it like being That's in the room my with, question. With, with Frank and Fran and, and Dave and Jerry? Oh. What was it like being in that room? For, how long were you in that room talking? Was it just one day? All day. Yeah. One day, though? Yeah. Yeah, I think we started at like eight. I don't even know when we finished. Even the, you know, the uh, just the interviews of yourself over... We did those mm-hmm. first thing in the morning. You did those first, and then you sat yep. down. I mean, yep. I... Uh, it, I think I, so. I think it was just the one day. I have such a terrible memory. I think so. I just, you know, Frank, I think, just didn't know what it was going to be. And, mm-hmm. you know, Steve was invited to do it, and he ended up not being able to do it. Yeah. And I just wondered what the hell I was doing there, you know? <laughs> I, I was like, woof. there's so many people that should be sitting here. No. Um but he asked, and I thought, well, okay. I, I wanted to be there because I just wanted to sit and, you know, hear Jerry tell stories yeah. and hear Dave and Fran. I just wanted to hear them tell stories, you know. I know, yeah. Um, and that's it's, all I love it was. watching it. I love uh, seeing it and hearing those stories, whether I've heard them before or not. And yeah. It's a very short movie. It's not very long at all. Was there anything left out that you remember from that day? Is there anything you can remember like, oh, yeah, there was this thing that happened? Yeah. We sang at the end. You did? We did. We got up and we sang. Oh, I can't remember. And I think I suggested, I, th- I said, I think we should sing something. Something led us into it. It was something about the camel. A Dave saying that Frank's camel, and then we started to riff on that. I'll be yeah. the son, I'll be the camel. And then after that, I think, I, f- I said, maybe we should just sing something, you know, because the Muppets are where right. That's what we love is singing. Yeah. And we got up, and I wish I could remember what it was. What a shame that I can't remember. And I, it was... And you did it on camera. You sang that song. We all stood up and sang. It really was a, a great present for fans of, of Muppets, uh, I think. And I'm, I've considered myself a fan of Muppets. I always have been and, and still am, really. I, I, I want the Muppets to succeed, you know. Right? I and, know. You know. Me too. Me too. That's you know? all I ever think about. Yeah. You know, what else? What can we do that... What else can we do? Gets people happy. But we'll be doing more of that. You know what? I want to ask you something. Yeah. Um, So, you know, there's kind of this um, Muppet, uh, uh, um, what do do you call it? Tradition, in a way, Mm -hmm. where over the years you had Frank and Jim. Yeah. Right? And then you have uh, Jerry and Richard. Yeah. And then you have Steve and Dave. Yeah. And then... I felt like Brian and I had a team up thing, you know. Yeah. Is there somebody that you feel like you team up or have over the years, like somebody that you've kind of been able to team up or? Uh, I don't. You know what? I feel like I fit really well with a bunch of different people. I mean, I, 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 like I don't everybody. Know. I do. I don't know why. Maybe it's this group of people, you know. And I right. work with Eric a lot because of Kermit and Piggy and. Right. Uh, and now even with Big Bird and Oscar, because I play Big Bird and he plays Oscar, so that yeah, tends to be right. something that we do a lot together. And yeah, I, you know what? It's well, I don't Floyd know. and Animal. Floyd and Animal. Yeah. So I end up right. working with with Eric quite a bit, but I also just I love like when we did um, Dead, <laughs> Deadly and Bobo for the, oh, that was so <laughs> for the Muppets movie. Oh my God, that was so much fun. I wish we had done so like more, or they would have left I, some of our stuff in. I do too, because I feel like yeah. it was really fun and, and enjoyable yeah. to watch. I I, I, I relish any time I get paired up with somebody. Yeah. It's, it's so much fun to be able to bounce off of somebody and play off of somebody. Yep. And our group. like, I so I I miss and you know I love you, but I like I miss playing with Steve with Rizzo yeah. and and, uh, um, and Pepe. And Pepe. Yeah, I know. And and Pepe and Kermit, we used to have some fun. And I'd love us to yeah. be able to f- do some more of that, you know. Yeah, so you and I'd I can that. F- find that playing. And I would love to find that because we have fun. We always laugh when we work together. <laughs> We're laughing you know? now. We laughed uh, <laughs> a lot here. I, I'm going to ask I mean, you I some. I don't. I don't like you, but but no, but I know. When but we it, work that together. doesn't matter. Yeah, we work together, <laughs> and we can laugh yeah. in that way. That's totally yeah. fine. Uh, yeah. I have some rapid fire questions I'm going to ask you. Oh my rapid. gosh. All right. So just whatever. Do I do long answers? You can do long (laughs) answers. You can do short answers. uh, Whatever. I'm not going to expand on it. I'm just going to go, yep, great. And then I'm going to ask the next one. All right? Okay. What's the hardest part about being a puppeteer? Uh, Keeping your arm up. What's the easiest part about being a puppeteer? Uh, Laughing. (laughs) What's your biggest strength as a performer? 
Hmm. Uh, listening. What's your biggest weakness? Uh, control. What's one of your favorite things about being a Muppet performer? Spending time with you guys. <laughs> if you weren't a puppeteer or performer, what would be your career? Or performer, does that include acting? Yeah, yeah, including acting, yeah. I want to see what Chef. else. Chef. Oh, I love that one. There are probably people listening who want to hear you tell them what they have to do to become a Muppet performer. What do I have to do, Bill? What would you tell them? Ah, uh, God. I don't know. Uh, I guess what would you do? You, you, you know, what's the Carnegie Hall thing? Practice, yeah. practice, practice. You have yeah. to, you have to learn. I think you have to learn how to act, and I think yeah. you've got to be technically proficient, and you've got to learn how to, like we were talking about earlier, you got to merge the two. And the sooner you start working both of those things at the same time, yeah, I think that's what it's about. About finding the balance of your puppeteering and your acting. Love it. Our buddy. Jerry Nelson, he said to me a long time ago, Sesame Street's great, but you always have to have something that is your own, that you mm. create. So, Bill, what is that for you? Well, hmm. I guess I'm still pursuing my acting. And so my dream is ultimately, and, I, and as I get older, I'm running out of time, but I think I still have some time, <laughs> uh, is to play Louis Prima. Oh, and so I would love to be, I'd love to act and portray a musical person like that. So uh, it's something to do with creating projects, but that specifically. Does that yeah. answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I don't absolutely. know if that's a thing because I mean, it's you, not like I'm going to be a magician. You but know, you also but, have, I mean, you do do your things on your own. You do the, the Jules videos. You've done those. Just started doing that, you, yeah. You, you and your brother, Gene, are doing a, a, a podcast, v vodcast. Right. I don't know what it is. Coming live up. videos. And that's like creative yeah. and that's yours. And, yeah. you know. I think it's and always cre creating stuff, I yeah. guess. I Here know. he is again, roping you into doing something, making you jump off the roof. I know. That's what know. he's doing. Yeah. He's like, okay, uh, we're going to every Saturday. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's Gene for you. Bill, yeah. thank you for talking to me. Well, hey. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Are we uh, done? <laughs> yes, we're done. That's it. That's Below the Frame for today. Be sure to connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Our show was produced by me with production assistance this episode from Andrew Moriarty. Our theme song was written by Stephanie DeBruzzo and performed by The Mighty Weaklings. Our podcast artwork was created by Dave Holtine at DaveHoltineDesign.com. A word from our sponsor players today for Good Lip Sync were Tal Bennett, Megan Pifus, Martin P. Robinson, and Stephanie DeBruzzo. Thanks to Bill Beretta, Peter Linz, Carmen Ospar, Martin P. Robinson, and Stephanie DeBruzzo, and my son Jack for being a part of this episode and thanks to you the fans for listening i'm matt vogel we'll see you next time when we go below the frame bye-bye go go, go below the frame.